we should talk about Walker Independence. We finally get to yeah. talk about it in a spoiler way. Uh, other than we're like, it's great. It's good. It's a Western. It's the 1800s. <laughs> so like we now get to say something of um, more substance than we've been able to do. So just to put the question out to both of you first, how is Walker Independence series premiere? I have to say it's even better the second time because nice. I rewatched it and I was like, ooh, this is like, I'm picking up on more things, picking up on more characterization, even more invested in the story. I'm, I'm blown away that I like the show, but I mean, that's a mark of a really good show that it's not my genre, but I really enjoy watching it. Yep. I'm totally with you on that. I feel like when this show was announced, this was the one we weren't entirely sure what to make of because mm-hmm. it's so inherently different to anything that the CW is used to producing. And I think that's why it works so well. It's ambitious, it's compelling, and I know we'll get into it more so as we talk about it, but I just wanted to say that, just like Reed said, I didn't think I'd get this attached right out of the get. And I think that's the strength of the pilot. It's very, very compelling. And on a third watch, I had, I had that up in my head there on a third (laughs) watch. It's every damn bit is good. I can't wait to watch it with everyone. It's so good. It is. I was also on my third watch. Um, and it is, it's amazing. The more you watch it, the more amazing it gets. It's also, I didn't expect it to be as funny as it is. Uh, yeah, a lot of that sure. has to do with Matt Barr and mm-hmm. his delivery. Yeah, there was one scene where I picked up. He like was it? I think it's his intro scene when he's fighting that person. I don't know who it was, but like oh, there's yeah. a there's a, a shot where the camera's on Hoyt's face, and he makes like a he like rolls his eyes or something, and it's it's such a small like moment, but it's funny and it's a it's a simple way to characterize Hoyt as someone who's not entirely serious. <laughs> yes. Cause it's the, uh, it's one of his parishioners cause he's been, he's been pretending to be a pastor. Um, and he's like quoting the Bible. Um, and uh, what does the guy say? He's like, you were lying every Sunday at church. And he's like, they were good sermons, Jacob. <laughs> <laughs> he's such a character right out of the gap. He is. And it makes, uh, it brings some levity to the pilot episode that it like it needs like because it's very off the bat we're very serious uh, mm-hmm. because murder happens in the first like five or so minutes yeah. um, and it's devastation and and Abby being a widow and then her being saved by members of the Apache and then wandering into like well not wandering she was led there by Callie and McCallie and couldn't go in into Independence Texas which is this very bustling small little dusty town. Um, it, the setting's great. Like, I really like how established all the buildings are. Um, and I did like it's Kate's, Kate's walkthrough with her briefly as they're, as she's shooting off real quickly, doing a lot of exposition to let Abby know what's going on in town. The second time around, I liked Kate's walkthrough intro a lot more. Um, the first time, like, I think the first time you watch any pilot, you're, you know, you're being introed into this world and you're just like Abby, you're kind of like seeing everything for the first time and taking it all in. So the first time I watched that scene, I'm like, oh, not another pilot exposition scene where there's a new character, you know, being so overtly gracious that it's kind of like, why would this person be this interested in a newcomer for no reason? But the second time around, it's, I saw it through uh, Katie Finley's, performance as Kate like that's who Kate is she's like I don't want to say a busybody but she's like you know she's invested in this whole thing she's the eyes and ears of this town and I I don't think the dialogue was super um because sometimes when you watch a pilot and there's those exposition dialogue scenes you're like Mm -hmm. okay that's heavy-handed um I think it, it that scene really walked a fine line and did it very well it's mm-hmm. quite a fine line. And I also think that if you don't know out the gate that I feel like this is not a spoiler for anybody who knows who Alan Pinkerton is, um, but she's, a, I'm just going to say it because you can Google him. He, she's a spy. <laughs> she were, the, the, She's a Pinkerton spy and she's in town um, investigating something, which is which in hindsight makes her walk through with Abby makes sense. 
Mm. Yeah, because she's like, oh, who's this new person? I need to get her on my radar. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that's it. Because she's, she's playing a character that's supposed to know so much about the town, that's why a lot of people would never know what she's really up to. I know we don't know what she's really up to yet, but she you never question why she knows so much. Of course, Abby did. She was like, you've asked so, a lot of questions, but it just it came across so well in that you pick up so much so quickly. And I know what, on the first watch, that can probably be quite overwhelming because you're hit with so much information at once. But again, Kitty Findlay's quirky performance, I think covered it up really nicely. It was, it was well-structured, well-written, and it made you really sit up and pay attention to a character like Kit. And I know the funny thing about independence is I love that line that Abby says is that people aren't quite what they seem. Mm-hmm. And she says it to Kit, which is probably now in hindsight, one of the funniest things of it all, because we know maybe Kit's not what she seems. There's a lot going on in so little, in those small little scenes. I really appreciate that. And Kate picked up on Abby too. Like she was like, oh, you're educated. Mm-hmm. So she's like, okay, <laughs> so you're not easily fooled. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, because this she quotes something. Part of me wants to say it's Frankenstein, but I actually don't know what um, what has God wrought um, mm-hmm. is from. Um, but it also just lets us know, like further know that Abby is an educator because we we do learn that in the beginning she's going over the codes with Liam, her husband, um, and that is going to serve her well in this community. I'm assuming that she will eventually start a school of some kind, but first she has to get justice for Liam and somehow prove that it was the sheriff that shot her husband. Okay, I have a question about this. Um, And I didn't really think about it on the first watch, but the second time I was like, okay, so she knows it was Tom Davidson who killed her husband, Mm -hmm. but does he remember her? Because he shot her too. I don't think so. It was dark, but she has like flaming hair. <laughs> like that's and like it's distinct. Isn't she in the same outfit too? Um, that part I do not know. Probably because she couldn't have had too many dresses. The um, because she was saved for one and for two, the wagon was set on fire. Hmm. Yeah, I, I assume that because he shot at her and she jumped out and then fell, he would. He assumed she was dead because he he. he the way it's filmed it makes it look like he did shoot her and then he had to run away because the the fire got too much so he jumped on the horse ran off so I assume that we're supposed to think that he thinks she's dead because the way it was told is Abby was very attention grabbing or attention grabbing when she walked into town everybody suddenly paid attention to her but he didn't so either that's intentional but then in the scenes after that he didn't seem too perturbed by the fact that this stranger was in town so I don't think he's aware of her yet, unless we'll find out later on at some point that he was. Mm-hmm. It's a question. Just like, I don't believe, I don't think Liam's as innocent in this as mm-hmm. Abby would love to believe. Oh yeah, there's uh, a bigger story there. Definitely. And it, def- it has to do with Boston, and which makes me wonder, are we going to get someone from Boston who comes to town to see her? Or if like we're just going to get the story from Tom at some point. But also his family is wreaking havoc too, so he doesn't really have too much of a leg to stand on either since they're stealing are they, they're stealing cattle and he knows it presumably yeah i think that's right because didn't abby make a comment at the end saying that's one way to get away with it because he's the lawman of the town um mm-hmm. it does sounds like his family's maybe up to something and they very strategically placed him as the sheriff so that they can continue to get away with whatever it is they're trying to get away with and then they did say, he's from boston as well isn't he tom davidson I'm pretty sure it didn't hike Tyler that at the end. So I wonder if like Tom Davidson knew to seek Liam out and kill him. And it, it wasn't just like, we know for a fact now that it wasn't just circumstance that led to this. So is this related to Liam's past in Boston? It, it, did the two of them know each other? I feel like the further Abby tries to get away from Boston, the more prominent it'll become in the show. And we were going to find out what actually went down there. And why were they trying to get away from it? I also want to know if Tom was there alone. Because as you said, it was very dark Mm -hmm. and we really only saw his facial hair, (laughs) (laughs) which was like, it gave enough away for us to know that it was him. But we didn't really see if there was anybody else like behind him. So that's another question I have. Like, are we going to find out in later episodes, like the camera's going to pull back and we're going to see like, I don't want it to be Augustus, but like, did he have like an accomplice with him? 
Hmm. I would say it's a family member. I don't think it's going to be Augustus either. He's shady. I don't know. Like, I like him, but all of his interactions are so like, you know something that you're not telling anybody. I don't trust him. I'm sorry. I love him, but I don't trust him. I don't trust anyone, I don't think. (laughs) People aren't what they seem. (laughs) He's played by film on Chambers. I immediately trust him. (laughs) Um, But I think it's also that um, Gus holds a lot close to the vest. He might be a person that's a lot like Katie, but instead of being like outwardly, you know, welcoming and getting getting information through being a bit too friendly, he's just enough friendly, but also closed off. But in a way yeah. that like he can collect information, but he is the I he seemed to get a little bit of I like to see with Callian that seems to be genuine about trying to get Callian to come into town. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but like all of his conversation not conversations but like interactions with Abby, he was like, "Have a good day in Independence," and I was like, "What is that smile hiding? <laughs> <laughs> like, what's happening here?" <laughs> well. Yeah, I'll go ahead, Michael. Sure, I was just going to say that I do get a warmth from him, but I get again, I find it hard to take maybe everyone, bar maybe one or two people, at face value because of the. I do think if there's a quote that's going to carry us through, it's the people aren't what they seem quote, and um, so it's hard to take anyone at face value. But I do feel like he's Augustus is warmer, obviously, than Tom Davidson. He's been portrayed in a very cold light because. There's no mystery here. We know for a fact what the sheriff has done. And I think the mystery is just going to be how is Abby going to get revenge? It's not who killed my husband. It's how am I going to get revenge on the man who did it? So I what I do wonder about how the relationship will develop between the sheriff and Augustus since he's the deputy. But it's interesting. I feel like Augustus absolutely knows that Hoyt was the one that committed the robbery when he said, I, I think I saw you in town earlier today, maybe on horseback. And then he kind of like shoved past him after tipping his hat uh, to Lucia. So there's definitely, I agree with Reed that it feels like he always knows more than he's letting on. I'm not sure it's in a dark fashion if he's like, if he's hiding a dark secret, but there's definitely yeah. more to him. He he lets people know that he's one step ahead of them without coming off um, threatening. Mm-hmm. Yes, well, except for the one time. There's one moment, if you remember when he was whistling the song that Abby was oh, playing true, in the true, wagon. True. That and he said it was because the sheriff was whistling it. I was like, but Augustus, that made my heart like beat really fast. Were you sure you weren't there? I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say though, I really like Tom Davidson. I think he's a really um, fun villain. Mm-hmm. Um, I know we're supposed to like not like him, and I don't like care for him, but I I like watching him. It's he he's also I'm just gonna have to say it. He's really handsome, so you guys don't have to reel me in from crushing on another <laughs> CW show villain. <laughs> <laughs> Tyro, eat your heart out. <laughs> I was like, oh, no, not another one. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I thought the scene, too, where Abby's, she stole Hoyt's gun and went into the, what was that party? Oh, the for the saloon at Hagen's? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, to introduce yeah. him. It was the sheriff's welcoming party. Okay, and she went there to kill him, which would have been, like, poetic. <laughs> <laughs> but she she does fire the gun, but it just goes right past his shoulder. I thought that whole scene, the cinematography too which is not to get into cinematography again i know we did that once with nancy drew but so many of the shots are gorgeous like we Mm -hmm. saw the perspective of her i guess it's not the perspective but we see like the close-up on her hand on the gun and so many of the shots the close-ups on her face tell so much more than Mm -hmm. her dialogue ever could yeah that's his response to it though because he Mm -hmm. just looks at the he's like oh (laughs) <laughs> when Augustus tells him, like, oh, so you're not scared, but you are aware of someone yeah. is yeah, probably it, looking it, for you. The funny thing is he kind of thrived in that moment. Like he, he absolutely strikes me as someone who loves chaos. And mm-hmm. he thought that was like, I think he was kind of touched by the fact that he's already a marked person and that he avoided that. So he, he's, I, I, he's a very fun villain and it's quite impressive that we get to say that because let's be honest, yes, 
he was an overarching presence throughout the whole episode, but he was only in like three scenes. So it was very well that they accomplished that very quickly. Um, and I agree that that's the scene of her marching up to the hotel with the gun in her hand, with the fireworks in the background, the close-ups on her face with the teary eyes as everyone else around her was partying and they didn't notice the gun in her hand. And then of course the slow-mo shot where she went to shoot him at height stopped her. Incredible, absolutely incredible. Um, and that really was, the moment. And the scene was expertly choreographed because we see Kai noticing Kate and then we see Lucia noticing Hoyt and Abby and like every the whole main cast is in this room just like from different angles and it sets up each dynamic where if any of these two any people in this cast any two people were to enter a room there's already established tension for Mm -hmm. anybody and that's what you really want in a pilot is that there's no um boredom if two characters are on screen they all have something already Mm -hmm. and I thought that that scene in particular really um connected a lot of dots because I was like how is this character going to connect to this person if Abby's all of their point of contact so far but we we, so many like dots were connected in that scene it's a great pilot (laughs) it just it really is it pulls you automatically in um and it is good that they have relationships outside of Abby so she isn't the central point like obviously she's the central point of the show with a little bit of you know um Hoyt being on the side but event uh, he, except for Lucia I just realized she's connected to um Hoyt and that's yeah. it right now um, she might have a little maybe jealousy with Abby mm-hmm. I don't know what mm-hmm. I don't I mean I don't want to project anything I don't know what she was feeling in that moment when she saw her with Hoyt um but I'm suspecting there will be some sort of um, conflict mm-hmm. yeah. with Abby. I don't know. She's at least going to be curious because it's the second time she's seen them together. Mm. Um, and he hasn't established who Abby is to him. Mainly because she isn't anyone to him other than a woman that keeps getting in trouble around him. But Lucia doesn't know that. Yeah, and the, they weren't taught. It didn't, to me, it didn't come off as romantic. They looked like they were scheming. <laughs> 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 they were allies scheming. <laughs> yes. But it's interesting that the pairing is going to be Hoyt, Abby, and Callian um, getting all the information they possibly can with that haunting cover of Wayfaring Stranger playing over at the burial site of um, Liam. And I should note, Liam Collins, I, be- I believe his last name is Collins, which means her name, Walker, is a name that she comes up with in the mm-hmm. middle of the premiere, which was a nice um, reveal of that piece of family history for anyone who actually watches Walker and might have just, I don't know if in that show, because you know we don't watch it, whether or not they had ever said that the family name wasn't um, wasn't one that they just had because it was a surname that there was a story behind it, but there's a story behind it now. Um, I assumed really cool. that it was like her maiden name, but I also kind of like that she made it up and inve- invented herself on the spot. Yeah. Mm. It was a real like dramatic character moment. And I know Abby had quite a few, but I feel like that was the moment she was like, she's going to take control of this situation because she, she remembered how they, uh, um, uh, Callie and called her walks and tall grass. As I think that's where Walker came from. Um, oh my God, you mm-hmm. guys are so smart. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like there for the vibes, not, <laughs> not getting anything. <laughs> you got cinematography. You went full film student. Yes, yes, I agree. <laughs> you inspired me in that moment. Um, yes. Uh, yes, I would not. Now, let's be honest. Now, you said we're smart. I wouldn't have got that if she hadn't. Did she? Did she hear him say Jean de C beforehand, which is what mm-hmm. they called her? Um, and then, then it came to her. Uh, so, but it is. It's an incredible character moment because, like, this what three years of a CW show and however many years the original went on for. But like this idea of like Walker has been in the public domain for so long, and it's such an interesting origin story that we finally got for the name now. I thought that was a really, really cool moment for her as well. And a very like power empowering moment considering all she'd been in just the first 20 minutes of that episode. And then to follow it up, basically how she like completely owned Hoyt when he tried to like do that terrible (laughs) job at a robbery. And she's like, do you want to take a a kidnapping victim? I can't, I can't. (laughs) (laughs) There are also a lot of um, other name references to the original, not original Walker, but the, the walker walker Mm -hmm. cw walker Mm -hmm. um like hoyt's horses cordell Cordell. which is it gives me like i i don't know if that if walker ever went into like 
the origins of their family but like it makes me interested in like okay how does because i'm assuming like abigail is the like the head of this family Mm -hmm. so like how did she end up how did somebody in her family end up named after her friend's horse that's a question i have and then um liam is her husband which is keegan allen's character's name in walker Uh, right yes i think Liam is his yes it's Liam it's Liam that's oh, the brother uh, okay. that's yeah, awesome. yeah. <laughs> I was like did I hear that wrong I was waiting for you guys to like confirm <laughs> um and then um I think one of Cordell's Cordell's kids his son is named August yes it, okay you know what the Easter eggs they're all over the <laughs> I know I'm like I want to know like how abigail starts her family and how all of this like how the lineage begins i think that's another interesting Mm -hmm. part too is because we have those easter eggs and i'm like how does it all lead to what we've seen on the cw so far yes because it's described as the first generation of walkers so we have like the matriarch abigail and how did we get there and who is she gonna start a family with or is that not gonna be a question we get until we get to the series finale season i don't know i mean i'm already wondering are you shipping anybody sabrina waiting her but i'm supposed to like i'm like <laughs> but it, i feel very much like that's going to be a tragic romance of some kind like mm-hmm. obviously he's oh, either they're going to be split and he's going to end up with lucia or somebody else and that's how you get the rollins line it's not abigail's line um but like anybody who's shipping them, prepare yourselves now because we already know those two family lines as well. I don't think they're connected. I think someone would have said that uh, a Walker fan would have said that the Rollins and Walker's lines at some point connect and then um, don't connect. Um, but that's where my heart is. I'm prepared for the heartbreak over time. Um, and that's about it. I mean, I'm, I'm interested in Callie and, and Augustus. Same. There was a little, I was like, hmm, (laughs) we'll we'll see. That's it. I think that's about it. Yeah. I'm I'm excited to see, because this episode had a lot of groundwork to cover, and I'm excited to see the romance maybe start to Mm -hmm. come up, because I think it's going to be obviously a big part of the show is building this family. So I'm like, hmm, I'm already wondering. Mm-hmm. You've influenced me, Sabrina, to like <laughs> to ship and like keep an eye out for relationships. Yay! <laughs> a new era of the ship watch has begun. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, I'm eager for all of that, all that you mentioned as well, because it's really, it's interesting now that we, we know, well, we don't because we're not Walker f- uh, fans. We haven't watched the show, but it's interesting to know where the story is heading and it was already interesting. We had an idea of how the story began because the trailer has been out there in the public domain for about close to six months now. And I've said this before, it's really interesting how you can take the same piece of media and make it better with one video package or worse with another. Mm -hmm. And it's Walker independence is the story of it is no different than the story we found in the trailer the show itself is far greater than the trailer suggested it would be. And I think that's a testament to the pilot because every pilot pilot, I, but this one, this, you had lower expectations because I don't think the trailer did it justice. And yet the pilot succeeded with fine colors. I thought it was a great job, but I think the most exciting thing now is, you know, how the story starts. We have a vague idea of where it goes in the future is the in-between space stage now we know nothing about. I'm kind of really excited to see what an episode two of Walker Independence looks like, what an episode three of Walker Independence looks like, what a season one finale looks like. And I'm really excited just to, as we go on this journey and get to know these characters better, how it all plays out. Yes, especially because they are trying to figure out how to do a crossover. That mm. was something that um, Seamus Fahey, the showrunner, was talking about. And I was like, I would like to see it. I don't know how you do it because he already said he, he didn't want to do one of those things where like one of the Walker characters go, I remember when I was told, <laughs> like, and then there's just the, like a, um, a flashback. So they're trying to figure out a way to do it organically in a way that makes sense, especially because I believe the show takes place in the 1870s. So it's not like we're going to be breaking out a picture. I mean, pictures did exist back then, but someone's not going to have a sepia toned 
picture that came from the attic before they started talking about Abigail. <laughs> <laughs> I could see them maybe doing something in what Arrow did in its first few seasons, which is where the main character, so in this case, it would be Jared Padalecki's Cordell Walker, learns a lesson that maybe their ancestor or in Arrow's case Oliver Queen from five years beforehand learned at the same time so you get to see both characters learn it so it would like flash back flash forward flash back flash forward just as just like modern Oliver learned in the present at the same lesson he would have learned five years ago when he was stranded on an island and you'd get to cut between them I wonder if maybe Walker might do something like that I guess it would have to be on an episode of Walker more so than Independence mm-hmm. so you could have like Cordell learn the same lesson that Abby learns sometime throughout her life but I mean maybe make Abby a bit older so that whatever she learns in that episode won't directly impact what's going on in independence at the same time if that makes sense it does Abby Abby finds a a time portal (laughs) (laughs) she ends up in modern days she's like how do I use an iPhone (laughs) I like your idea better all right (laughs) That's the multiverse. <laughs> yes, the multiverse. And then she's messing up history as she goes, comes back to her own time and something's not right. Christ Suddenly married to Tom. Walkers. Yes, Christ oh, no. of infinite walkers. <laughs> oh, we laugh, but um, CW, do not get any ideas. <laughs> oh, no. But continue to have the idea about bringing WB and CW stars for cameos in Walker Independence because mm. that's also a thing that was teased. Yes. Oh my gosh. What did I say to you? I was, oh, Sophia Bush. Yes. Come home. (laughs) Sophia Bush, come home. (laughs) Who would she be? Like, like, would she be one of the dancers? Would she be like? I have no idea. Just at least one episode, I think would be so fun. It would be. We have, they'd have to introduce her in the saloon. She'd have to lean over the bar and say something like whispery as she's getting information from somebody. That'd be amazing. Manifesting. Daydreaming about it now. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to think who else could come out. I have to say, the obvious choice for me, Kitty Cassidy. I mean, there you go, mm-hmm. CW, the queen of the CW, more CW shows under her belt than anybody else. Worked with Jared Padalecki on Supernatural, worked with Kat McNamara on Green Arrow and the Canary slash Arrow. So, I mean, like, it lines up, make it happen. Yes. And mine would be an obvious pick, Candace Patton, whenever yes. she has time. Ooh. Yes, yes. She, she might she might have some time after next season so make it happen yes let her pop on down into Santa Fe Mexico to film a scene like she's pretending to be in Texas and this <laughs> time with me oh I want it so bad but it'll be fun seeing the cameos pop up this season if they if they can get them this season I already have them in season two like they've been renewed but like, <laughs> 